change theory and its relationship to dissemination and diffusion. This is Katherine P. Fulford at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. As an instructional designer or media developer or administrator, you are a change agent. This is something that you need to think about as you try to create innovations. Dissemination and diffusion is part of the process. Dissemination is the process of distributing an innovation. We can think of our ideas as being very creative and very exciting. However, on the other end, when people receive them, they might perceive it as just a lot more work and change that they didn't need. While diffusion is the process of ensuring that an innovation is used throughout the system, dissemination is typically a one-way process with little or no feedback. You just send out materials, while diffusion involves stakeholders in the development process. To conduct a quality dissemination and diffusion plan, you really need to know about change theory. The last thing we need are more barriers between students and teachers. Change can be constructive or destructive, so you need stakeholder buy-in. Don't fix what isn't broken. The cycle of change, created by Ronald Havelock in the Change Agent's Guide to Innovation in Education, looked like this. We have some kind of initial disturbance or pressure from the inside or outside, or crisis. Next was the feeling of need and decision to do something about the need. Then the diagnosis of the need as a problem, followed by a search for solution. And then the application of a possible solution to the need. And then the satisfaction that the problem is resolved, or dissatisfaction resulting in the repeat of the cycle. He also said that there are four ways to be a change agent. One is to be a change agent as a catalyst, providing pressure on a client system to change. This could be any number of people, for example, parents who would like to see change in a school, or students in a university that would like to see change in the way their courses are delivered. You can also be a change agent as a process helper, so you can help somebody collect data and make decisions that they need to act. This might be somebody within the system or a consultant from outside of the system. Then there are change agents as solution givers. These might be your media developers, where they come in and provide innovations and solutions to the system. My favorite is the change agent as a resource linker. When somebody calls me and needs help and I'm not able to provide that help, what I like to do is link them with other resources that will help them. Remember, change is expensive. So the first rule of change is that all change is so expensive that the first option is to do nothing, make no change. That's a hard rule to follow because people are really excited about innovation, but remember it's very expensive, so make sure it's worthwhile before you commit the resources. The instructional designer is often a process helper change agent, and it's our job to make sure that acceptance is gained when we innovate, but that means we have to start at the top with stage one in building a relationship. Effective change occurs when all stakeholders are involved. Change must involve people, and change must not be imposed upon the people. Rule two, consistent results are worth twice as much as variable results. Otherwise, risk is expensive. What do you think this means? Usually, within a system, we would like everybody to change as quickly as possible. However, if only some of the people change some of the time, that's not going to be a very good case. So, how do we affect broad-based change? I like to recommend what I call a grid approach. What that means is that when we are expecting broad-based change, we make sure we have a sampling of stakeholders involved. For example, if we were going to conduct management training in an organization, we might recruit people from administrative, professional, clerical, and maintenance positions to be involved. We would also consider ethnicities because they bring a variety of viewpoints. It's also good to get people of different ages. Again, their perspectives are important. Another idea is to make sure you have people at the beginning level of a job as well as intermediate and advanced people. People who are just starting a job may not know much, but they know what it's like to be new. People who've been there a long while, yes, they may have a lot of ideas that are older, but they have a broad perspective of the organization or system involved. Next is to make sure you think about where people are from. 
In many places, we think the culture we have is unique, so we feel like we want to be represented when it comes to who is on the Committee for Change. By providing a number of slots for these stakeholders, that's a really important idea. As a change agent, it's very good to be able to be a resource linker. You may not always have the time and resources yourself to be able to help all the clients that you have. So knowing where key resources are in the community is a way to create a wonderful educational community as well as linking resources together. Remember that the guy in the big chair isn't always the big guy. Hmm, what do I mean by this? Sometimes there are other people that are key in an organization to getting things done. This is the man or woman that has the ability to sign off either on a budget or on decisions that are made. Whereas somebody that's an opinion leader can actually make change happen. He or she is the person that people will follow. Think of these three forms of power. First we have the authority power, that signature power. Next, we have personal power. This is where you have people that have a lot of charisma. And then there's referent power. Referent power is the strongest of the three. The person with referent power is the most influential person in the system. What does referent power mean? That is somebody that people refer to. In other words, somebody that's smart and knows what's going on. Although it's very rare, sometimes people have all three of these. President John F. Kennedy was one of these people. He clearly had the authority, but he was also very charismatic and very smart. He's a great example of somebody with three-in-one power. Which of these three people do you involve in change? All of them if you can. You always need your person of authority to be able to sign on the bottom line and provide access to the rest of the organization. Somebody with good charisma is wonderful, especially as a role model or even as a spokesperson. Next, referent power. This is somebody that's a very powerful person in the organization. You need as many of these as you can get in each section of the system. Our next concept are gatekeepers. Ask yourself, who holds the key to information processes and resources? Who controls the flow of information into, through, and out of the system? Examples of gatekeepers are secretaries, fiscal officers, information technology people, and administrators. Ask yourself, how can you get them to open the door for you? There are all sorts of ways of doing this. It never hurts to be grateful for the services they render. Get to be good friends with them. A box of candy doesn't hurt. Say hello to them when you come into the office. Make sure you pay attention to these people. They are very valuable. With innovations growing in the 1990s, Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson became a really popular book. It's about four characters. Sniff, who likes to sniff out change early. Scurry, who scurries into action. Haw, who learns to adapt in time when he sees something better. And him, who denies change as he fear it will lead to something worse. So these four characters are also seen in Everett Rogers' book, The Dissemination of Diffusion. When we think of those innovators or early adopters, we might see the character Sniff. Our early majority might be Scurry, our late majority Haw, and our laggards, him. Laggards are the people that take usually twice as long to adopt as the late majority. A lot of people think that later adopters are just old, but that's not necessarily true. Let's take a look at the socioeconomic characteristics that make somebody an early adopter or a late adopter. There's no difference in age. However, they have more education. They usually have higher social status, more upward mobility. They have larger units, in other words, larger houses, larger schools, larger businesses. They have more economic or commercial orientation. They're more likely to borrow money, and they're more specialized. Personality variables would be that they have greater empathy. They're less dogmatic, in other words, have a closed belief system. They deal better with abstractions. They have greater intelligence. They generally have a better attitude about change and a better attitude about science. They're less fatalistic, in other words, having to do with the ability to control one's future. They're also more highly motivated and have higher aspirations. In terms of their communication behavior, they have greater social participation and are more socially integrated. They're more worldly. They have greater exposure to the media. They have more contact with change agents. 
They seek information and have greater knowledge of innovations. They have a higher degree of opinion leadership, and they're more modern than traditional. So, if we look at this curve, SNF is representative of these innovators and early adopters. Scurry, again, is early majority, Haw, late majority, and Laggard's him. So you can see this is on the basis of how innovative they are. So my question to you is who do you want on your team? Do you want only the innovators? Only the early adopters? That's probably going to create a problem because then you won't have the understanding and opinion of those other groups. Putting some of these people on your team helps you get a sense of what they're about and what their objections are. Another way to look at this is called an S-curve. This shows you the percentage of adopters over time. Note that it takes quite a while for all of the people to adopt. One of the funny ones in my lifetime had to do with people growing their hair long. So in the 1960s, it was a very small group of people in the beginning. And as time went along, more and more people had long hair until finally, at the end of the curve, most people had cut their hair and only a few people still had it long. You see this in almost every type of change, whether it has to do with new fashions or whether it has to do with innovations from technology. One of the things that we don't want to do is throw money down the drain. So our third rule is concern about sunk cost is not a good reason to spend more and it's not relevant to decision making. What do I mean about sunk cost? Here's an example that many of us have faced. We have an old car. We've just fixed the brakes. We spent a couple of thousand dollars to do it. And now something else goes wrong. We just put the money into the car, so we're inclined to keep it and spend more money. The problem is we may keep dumping more and more money into the car when we should have just gone out and bought a new one. This can apply to computer systems in businesses. It can apply to all kinds of things. So be careful not to get sucked in to thinking about sunk cost. One of my thoughts has always been first grade would be all right if it weren't for the 11 sequels. A lot of times we get caught up in the way things are and we keep going that same direction. A good example of that would be the graded school system. First grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. The question is, how did we get that in the first place and is it still a good idea? They're often confused barriers to change. Laggards or late adopters have less capability to change, recognize them, and move forward anyway. Blockers, however, are different. They actually resist a particular change, perhaps for a good reason. They may even be early adopters, so it's important to listen to them and incorporate their suggestions. Gatekeepers are also important. You need to involve and win them over from the beginning and make sure that you stay in communication. What's unfortunate sometimes is that one person may be all three, a laggard, a blocker, and a gatekeeper, and then you've got a real problem. Constraints are not a person. Constraints are non-human barriers. For example, lack of budget, resources, poor policies, procedures, and facilities. These can also create barriers to change, but they're different than the human barriers. I loved some of these sayings from Who Moved the Cheese? The handwriting on the wall. Change happens. They keep moving the cheese. Anticipate change. Get ready for the cheese to move. Monitor change. Smell the change often so you know when it's getting old. Adapt to change quickly. The quicker you let go of the old cheese, the sooner you can move on to the new cheese. Change. Move with the cheese. Enjoy change. Savor the adventure and enjoy the taste of the new cheese. Be ready to change quickly and enjoy it again and again. They keep moving the cheese. Last but not least, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I'm not sure where this quote came from, but I think it's a good one in response to creating change. Let's also think about once you've decided on an innovation, how do you get it installed? So the installation process means that you have to obtain agreement from the stakeholders. You have to make sure you have enough resources and you have to overcome the blocks to change. You also need to recruit change leaders into the process and infuse the innovation into the system. Activities to involve people in the process might be meetings with individuals and groups, needs assessments, surveys or focus groups, as well as work groups. Methods to communicate and market your innovation. 
You might use newsletters, email lists, websites, or training. If you want to institutionalize and maintain your innovation, make sure you have continued resources. Complete the adoption by having new positions to make sure that the innovation stays in place. Create a system for updates and upgrades. I'm going to wrap up with Cotter's Eight Steps to Successful Change. First, you need to create a sense of urgency in your organization for the change, and it can't be something from top down. You need to make sure to build and guide your coalition. Next, form a strategic vision and initiatives so people know where you're going. Enlist a volunteer army of stakeholders so that they'll be by your side through the change. Enable action by making sure to remove the barriers. Sometimes change doesn't happen because there are too many barriers to change already. Make sure you generate short-term wins. Set interim goals so people can see the success. Make sure you sustain the acceleration. Don't let it die on the vine because you turn to another project. Make sure that you institute the change. Try to incorporate it in your regular budget and your regular personnel schedule. Make sure, in all, create change ethically. This will have long-term and lasting effects. Here are some references for your further study.